Good morning, everyone. Today I am returning to our message on Zephaniah. Uh, this is actually the fourth message on Zephaniah. And I'm actually only going to preach on three verses. But it's amazing what those verses actually contain. But before we actually get there, let's all turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armour of God so that you, you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rule, the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armour of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything to stand, stand firm therefore, having girded your loins with the truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. As Christians, you know, Paul's saying, arm yourself, prepare yourself. You know, it is a war of sense, in a sense of uh, what we're fighting. Yesterday I was, uh, went to Kurong and actually just picked, a book, picked up a book which uh, the title caught my eye. I opened it at a random place and um, read something that was interesting. I took a photo of the page just because I wanted to read it out, but I didn't want to um, transcribe it. It was long enough. So I hunted on the internet and actually found an equivalent sort of a passage. So I'll just read that here. It's a discussion between a camel, a son, and the, uh, the the son, uh, the camel's mother. For instance, a mother camel and her offspring were taking one day, were talking one day, when the young camel asked, "Mum, why do I have these huge three-toed feet?" The mother replied, "Well, son, when we uh, trek across the desert, your toes will help you stay on top of the soft sand." "Okay," said the son. A few minutes later, the son asked, "Mum, why do I have these long eyelashes?" They are there to keep the sand out of your eyes on the trips through the desert. Thanks, Mum, replied the son. After a short uh, while, the son returned and asked, Mum, why do I have these great big humps on my back? The mother, now a little impatient with the boy's questions, replied, They are there to help us store water for our treks across the desert so we can go without drinking for long periods of time and not get thirsty. Thanks, Mum. So we have huge feet to stop us from sinking into the sand, long eyelashes to keep the sand out of our eyes, and these humps to store water for long trips in the desert, right? Yes, son, that's right. Well then, why in the world are we living in the San Diego Zoo? <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting little narrative. But we just read Ephesians 6. We've got the sword of the spirit, shield of faith, Got um, the uh, sandals of the preparation of the gospel. Now ask yourself, what zoo are you living in? Now, you know, it's it's interesting when we actually stop and look around and see what perspective our worldview is. Um, in my folder here, I noticed this morning because uh, this was something I used quite a number of years ago. Um, when you think of modern technology, what do you think of? One of these? 
The kids are going, what's this? <laughs> That's modern technology 20 years, 30 years ago. Um, and it's amazing what our, how our worldview changes with time. But when we look at history, you've heard the, the statement, history repeats itself. Zephaniah is a book where history repeats itself. We look at what's happening in the world today and history is repeating itself. Though the world doesn't see that. They can't see it. Because as far as they're concerned, the Bible is a storybook. When you think of the book of Zephaniah, now, you know, like I said, this is the fourth message. Anyone here still not read the book completely? Anyone going to put their hand up? <laughs> Anyone still doesn't know where it is in the Bible? <laughs> but when we think of Zephaniah, we've got to remember that you know, Amos and all the other prophets, they um, spoke to the nation right, for hundreds of years. You know, Amos was around 100 years before Zephaniah. And it's interesting what he says. A hundred years before Zephaniah, Amos says, Seek the Lord that you may live, or he will break forth like a fire, O house of Joseph, and it will consume you, consume with none to quench it for Bethel. You know, he's using synonyms for Judah, for the people of God, for the house of God. You know, it's Jerusalem and Judah. It's the people of God. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word, for the history you've preserved in your word to show us how your people should, leave, should live and what happens when they don't live the way they should, the consequences. But well, we know that you're loved, Lord, because in your mercy and grace you always call us back. You seek for us to repent. You seek for us to return to you. And Lord, I pray this day that this message will get out of it that urgency to seek you more, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. The background of Zephaniah. We have the books of Kings and Chronicles. And I've mentioned this before. You know, if you read Kings and Chronicles, you'll get a background for what the uh, what was happening in the world around Israel at that time. 2 Kings 21 to 23 is very pertinent to what's happening regarding the message of Zephaniah. And indeed, uh, in 2 Kings 21, it actually reads that the rest of the acts of some of the kings, aren't they written in the books of Chronicles? So we have a, a, an emphasis here We've got a background, and don't forget, read here as well. It's interesting that God actually, in his word, tells us who's reigning at what time and when prophets are speaking. He, wants, he doesn't want us to be ignorant of what's going on. Everything has a setting. Okay. This disc has a setting. It was very relevant in the early 90s. Not relevant anymore. I doubted I'd be able to get any information off it, whatever was last on there. But everything's got a setting. As kids, you know, I remember being your age. Doesn't seem like that long ago to me. <laughs> but time flies. You know, and it probably sounds funny me saying this to you, but one day you'll say it to one of your kids and you go, he was right. <laughs> and you know why we can say that? Because I said it about my father too. Um, we have to learn from history. We'll learn not to make the same mistakes. Why would we want to make the same mistakes as our parents or grandparents? Or this country or that country. So when we look at Zephaniah, 
you had a period of kings that were, was, well, you had a good king, Hezekiah. But then you had the subsequent sons who were bad, bad kings. And so for a long time, the country had bad kings, bad government, bad influence. And the surrounding nations were no better. They tried to exert their influence on Israel and Judah. It was only when Josiah, who was the uh, great uh, grandson of King Hezekiah, came along that you actually had another good king. So for 70 years it was bad kings. And indeed when you look at the nations around Israel and Judah, you know, whether it was Egypt in the south, Assyria and Babylon in the north, Israel was caught in the middle between great conflicts. Zephaniah. The major themes of Zephaniah, obviously sin and rebellion. When we look at the minor prophets, or even any of the prophets, I'll ask yourself this, why do we have the books of the prophets? In the Bible, why do we have the books of the prophets? It's got to be a reason. When we think about priests in the Old Testament, who were the priests? They were man's representative before God. The prophets were God's representatives before men. It was the prophets who came saying, repent. Why? You're off track. When you think of some of Paul's letters even, Paul didn't write letters because things were going good. He wrote letters because things were going bad. You know, we have this word and the instruction manual, if you like, is saying, here are the circumstances, they were going bad, things were going wrong, fix it, and here's how to fix it. That's what Zephaniah is all about. Things are going bad, you need to fix it. Indeed, Zephaniah is actually a, um, a book where things are so bad that if we turn to Ze uh, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 3... So if you know where the book of Matthew is and you go back four books, so it's um, from Matthew's Gospel, it's back to Malachi, back to Zechariah, back to Habakkuk and uh, then Zephaniah. Sorry, Haggai and then uh, Zephaniah. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse, studying verse 2. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. There you go. Great. Starts off with a positive note. Wouldn't you love to receive that message? Wouldn't you love to be Zephaniah right in this message and saying, do I really have to say this? Because when you think of the, um, the false prophets of the day, when you think of the, the people of the day, could you imagine going to Brisbane or any other city in Australia setting in, up and say, God's going to destroy everything. You think people are going to look kindly on you? Same too for Zephaniah, no doubt. When you think 70 years of bad, of bad kings, and you're going to stand up and preach this, he wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been popular. So the, we have in Zephaniah the major thing of sin and rebellion, covenant disloyalty, covenant judgment and a call for repentance. But when you think of the covenant, what's the covenant? Do you understand a covenant, what a covenant is? Can anyone make a covenant? Well, we make covenants all the time, don't we? But can anyone make a covenant with God? And you go home and decide, hey, I'm going to make an agreement with God. Is it an agreement between two parties or two or more parties? How can you be in anyone be in covenant with God unless God decides to be in covenant with you? 
That's actually an interesting point in this message. Now, God is sovereign over his covenant people, the pagan nations, and all of creation. And all the so a theme is the day of the Lord. Marriage is a covenant. You know, when you think of it, not in its modern context of where people can go to a registry, o- registry office and, you know, do you take this person, yes, no, to the, sign here, all right, you're married, congratulations. When you think of more traditional marriage uh, arrangements in the past, whether it's an arranged marriage, like it exists in some cultures, or even traditional uh, marriages where um, the two people are both consenting. Right. It was a covenant agreement. It was two people making vows. And when you think of marriage vows, you know, it's like, um, do you, so-and-so, take this person to love, honour, cherish, da 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 They're the terms of the covenant, terms of the agreement. Now, of course, in the modern society, some of those vows are now uh, frowned upon. You know, they looked at it on as being old hat. What you read, what you can see up on the overhead, is actually called the uh, Mayflower Compact. It was an uh, agreement signed uh, back in 1620 by uh, people aboard the Mayflower, the ship that came to America at that time. And they made an agreement amongst themselves uh, for 15, almost 15 years now. Kenneth Copeland has been calling that a covenant. Um, and it's interesting in the April letter from Kenneth Copeland, he says, this nation, say so the US, is the only one in history founded by people who loved Jesus and for the purpose of worshipping him. God founded Israel because he loves them. The Lord is in covenant with this country and he can never forget it. It is up to us, therefore, to pray, seek his face for his choices of candidates, talking about the elections, uh, for public office, and then vote in faith, calling things that be not as though they were. And he goes on saying a few other things. But as far as Kenneth Copeland's concerned, God's in covenant with America. It's an interesting idea. But you've got so many people on a boat, they sail to America and they say, great, we're not going to be under oppression like we were in Europe. We're going to make this country you know, a godly country. So let's write an agreement to do that. Does that mean you're in covenant with God? Can anyone think, really think they're going to be in covenant with God that way? When you think of what's in here, you, know, you think about the covenant in the Old Testament, God says, do these things, and the people of Israel said, yes, we agree to everything you've said. Well, there's blessings and there's curses. You know, it doesn't matter if I pick, up, pick on America. It can be Australia or Canada or England, any Christianised country that, in a sense, was Christian at some stage. If any country wants to say they're in covenant with God, look at where that country is now. Look at where Australia is now. Do we want to, would you really want to be in covenant with God? when all you've done is spit on that covenant, effectively? You know, if we pick on America again, you know, we'll take the Bible out of the courtroom, out of the school, out of the hospitals, out of wherever we want. But don't worry, we're in a covenant with God and God's got to bless us. God bless America. Australia's no different, though. 
April when this newsletter came out. Texas, where Kenneth Copeland Ministries is located, was hit by floods. Eight killed, billions of dollars worth of damage. Brisbane experienced its own floods not five years ago. Well, only five years ago. Then this month also we've seen fires in Canada, once Christianised country. Yeah. Entire city forced to flee. I don't know if you saw the news, those news stories. I mean, that is a massive fire and they're talking about it being weeks before they can even think of it being put out. History repeats itself. In a sense, judgment comes. Now, whether or not these things are of God, I can, I'm not, can't say. I'm certainly not going to definitively say they are. But if you want to say that America's in a covenant with, a, with God, how long should God put up with America before he says, um, I've had enough with the way you're doing things? That's what, he's, what Zephaniah is about. I've had enough with what you're doing. Judgment's coming. That's the book of Zephaniah. Indeed, when you look at the book of Revelation, you look at the entire world, there's going to come a point in time where God's going to say, that's it, had enough, time's up. So let's turn to Zephaniah chapter 2. Zephaniah 2, verses 1 to 3. So in chapter 1, it spoke about all the uh, wrath that is coming, the judgment of God that's coming. And then finally in chapter 2, he starts with, Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame. Before the decree takes effect, the day passes like the chaff. Before the burning anger of the Lord comes upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness Seek humility, perhaps you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Now Zephaniah, his name means hidden in Yahweh or hidden in the Lord. And indeed, you know, his name is drawn, used, utilised in that manner in these verses. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. But you notice the befores in verses 1 to two, one and 2. You know, it's, gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame. Before the decree takes effect, the day passes like the chaff. Before the burning anger of the Lord comes upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Well, before which decree? He just said, before the decree takes effect. Which decree? That would be the decree we read right at the beginning. In verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth. And then he goes on to explain the more specifics about Israel. But when we look at chapter 1, which we've previously looked at, you know, in verse 7, it talks about the day of the Yahweh which is near. The day of the Lord's sacrifice in verse 8. Verse 10, that day. Verse 14, near is the great day of the Lord, near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord, in it the warrior cries out bitterly. Verse 15, a day of wrath is that day, a day of terrible trouble and distress. A day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Verse 16, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. And verse 18, neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on that day, on the day of the Lord's wrath. And all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy, for he will make a complete end Indeed, a terrifying one of all the inhabitants of the earth. It's very dire. 
You know? And here's God saying, gather yourselves before that day approaches. But the interesting thing is that gather is not the gather you might see in um, a solemn assembly. It's obviously got that inference of Israel coming together as a solemn assembly and saying, and de- uh, devoting themselves back to God. But that word for gather is actually used um, more often as in the sense of stubble. So when the Israelites were in Egypt and they had to gather straw to make bricks, it was they had to gather stubble. It's that gather. Um, same too in Numbers, I think it was, the man who was caught gathering sticks on the, day, on the Sabbath day. It's that gather. You know, so it's not coming together as a, a group to worship because they're stubble. What's chaff? It blows away in the wind. They're going to be dispersed anyway. The people have gone against God. Their worth is now almost worthless, like stubble. But they're told they should need to come back to God before it's too late. But that's the same with all of us, isn't it? We need to come to God before it's too late. You know, there's no point um, waiting before you're standing before the throne of judgment and going, okay, I repent. That's not going to work. You know, the, the nation has said it's a nation without shame. They're not embarrassed. Look at society today. They're not embarrassed. They relish their sins. When you think about some of the songs that have been written, um, one to pick on would be um, Highway to Hell. The ACDC, I think it's ACDC song. They enjoy their sins. They enjoy mocking God. That's what Israel did. History is just repeating itself. A nation without shame. But what's it saying? God doesn't use words idly or lightly. If he's calling them a nation without shame, what's he saying? You should be ashamed. Indeed, when you think about the gospel and, and people find, you, you know that light that comes on when people finally, people finally realise their sin and they finally get ashamed of it and go, oh dear. It's only then that they repent and turn to God. A proud person or someone who's proud of their sins doesn't repent and come to God. We have to be ashamed of our sin. We have to be ashamed of our state. But in verses 1 and 2, it's nationalistic. Right? The cry's gone out to the nation. Gather yourselves before it's too late. But the problem is, the cry goes out to everyone. You know? But how many respond? You know, it's, it's that same sort of verse as um, in the Gospels where it says... Um, Many are called, but few are chosen. The gospel has been spread far and wide, but how many people have responded to it? The good news of coming to God, or the good news of repenting, which sounds like a bit of a a paradox, or irony even, for some people. The good news of repenting. That book that I uh, mentioned earlier on, its uh, title was actually uh, (coughs) Celebrating the Wrath of God, which sounds like a strange title. The subtitle was um, something along the lines of um, something about God's love. (coughs) And it sounds like a complete contradiction, doesn't it? Celebrating the wrath of God and, and God's love. But isn't that what uh, God's 
um, doing here, saying, come back to me, return to me, repent. How do you know God's a God of love? Because he warns us before the wrath comes. No. If God wanted to, he could just say, time's up, had enough of these guys, wiped them out. Why would he have to warn us? We already got the books of Moses. or well, they already had the books of Moses. They knew what the Ten Commandments were. They knew what the law was. Why did he have to warn them for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years? God's a God of love. But it is the day of the Lord's anger. And we all have to make a decision, or everyone does make a decision, before that day arrives. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. often called the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, starting in uh, verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on top of the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When you think of the Beatitudes, do you think of Zephaniah? Not yet? What about uh, next chapter over, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9. The Lord's Prayer. Pray then this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But when you think of what's in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus then goes on to qualify in verses 14 to 19. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive you your transgressions. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on heaven, uh, treasures on earth rather, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. When we look at the Beatitudes, and the Lord's Prayer, it talks about being humble but also being sincere. It means um, doing things regarding repentance before God or doing good deeds before God 
and don't do it to be showy. You know, it's who are we doing things for? Why are we doing things? What's our motivation? When you think of judgment, do we want God to judge us according to his own grace and mercy or according to the standard we ourselves set when we judge others? We must be humble. It's about God, not us. So when we look at the Beatitudes and we look at the Lord's Prayer, and now if we go back to Zephaniah chapter 2, We've read verses 1 and 2, that nationalistic call to repentance. Verse 3. Chapter 2, verse 3. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth, who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. You, know, you can see a direct parallel with the Beatitudes, especially, about seeking humility or seeking the Lord in humility, seeking righteousness. Often in the Bible you'll, you'll see things repeated. You know, it's, it's that thing that is usually... Um, it's usually Things are repeated twice for emphasis. But here in Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 and 3, we see a threefold repetition. You know, in to the nation it was before, before, before. Before the day comes, before time is up. But for those who are among God's people who do respond, it's how do you respond? It's seek the Lord. We said, seek, seek, seek. Even indeed, Jesus himself says, seek and you will find. But our actions speak more than our words, don't they? Have you ever told someone the gospel and they've agreed with you and agreed with you, but... It's exactly the same. They're not interested in, you know, it, oh yeah, I'd like to go to heaven. Okay, yeah. I'll say this prayer. But have they repented? Repentance is an, is an action. It's not just saying you agree to something and then don't do it or don't have a corresponding action. You know, the humble of the land, or the humble of the earth, actually, there, all you humble of the earth. In the Hebrew, it's um, in the, the humble in the land. Well, the gospel's been ga- gone into all the world. Who are the people that respond to the gospel? Have you responded to the gospel? It's only those who are humble. It's not about me, it's about God. Okay, I can't save myself. You know, you have to be able to say that. You have to admit, I can't save myself. There's nothing I can do to wash away my sins. No amount of good deeds are going to undo the bad deed I did. Because it was done. When you look at what the Lord is saying, can you see his love? Can you see his grace and mercy? When you consider what the nation has been doing, chased after false gods, worship false gods, um, just totally neglected God's law, God's righteousness, when you think of God's righteousness, what God says is right and God's uh, way of doing things that are right, people just wholeheartedly neglected what they were supposed to be doing. 
and you think about some of the bad kings, when you look at Manasseh, King Hezekiah was a good king. His son Manasseh was a bad king. He was so bad that he sacrificed his own children in the fires of another god. How bad does a nation have to get? How bad does a people have to get? Why shouldn't God have just said, time's up then? But he waits, and he waits, and he waits. And he's still waiting. You know, we, we can look at what's going on in the world and say, Lord, when are you coming back? And God's probably repeating what, to us what he said to Zephaniah, or what we can see in Zephaniah and the Minor Prophets. Just be patient, not yet. There's still more. But when we look at what we read or in Zephaniah, sorry, Ephesians earlier on, you know, are we prepared? You know, when you look at what is written in the New Testament about spreading the Gospels, speaking to people, revealing God to them, you know, how will they hear unless someone goes, Paul says. You know, are we just in a zoo? doesn't really matter if the zoo's your own home. Do your kids know the Lord? Are they Christianized or do they know the Lord? Two different things. Uh, when I look at my own family, my own brothers and sisters and, and their kids, they don't know the Lord. Not all of them anyway. Same to my parents. Um, my father, for example, um, was in the Air Force. He went to, I think it was Singapore or Malaysia and a few other countries during his postings and whatever. And we had this little, I don't know, brass Buddha statue. And I've still got it. And I walk in and I see the thing and I just want to toss in the bin. Um, just one of those little annoying things. And yes, you, you might say there's an argument to say, hey, it's just a memento of their time in Asia. Well, that's one way of looking at it, especially if you don't ascribe any divine qualities to Buddha and da, 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 all the rest of it. But what does it represent? When we look at um, our own house, what's in our own house where someone who doesn't know the Lord comes and sees something in your house? He goes, oh, he's a Christian. Oh, that's acceptable, is it? And the house we bought is um, the people actually obviously did some travel in Asia as well. Um, they had photos up and around the, the place when we were inspecting it and on the, outside the front door was a wooden carved mask, one of those big teeth and all the rest of it. Um, the Philippine, one of the Philippine gods or in their mythology of uh, the dragon who ate the moon or something or other, um, I did look it up at some stage. It was interesting, I actually contemplated bring it in as a prop at some stage. But there's no way I'll leave that in the house. It's in the garage gathering dust uh, in a very... It's not the neatest position it's in. It's certainly uh, just sort of tossed in. But what, are they, what would it say if I had something like that at the front door? Oh, yeah. You know, whether it was Jehovah's Witness coming around, Mormons or anyone else, they want to speak about the Bible. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Look at this thing and go, oh, okay. Really? Yeah, what, does it, what does it say about you know, uh, someone who says they're Christian? You know, my, my father was, uh, is Catholic. And I always found it an irony to walk in and there's this little brass Buddha 
near the front door. <coughs> you know, it's such a contradiction. But if God's not real to anyone, if they don't know the real gospel, if they haven't repented and turned to God, it's not real. And that is just a memento. It doesn't represent anything and it doesn't, they don't see the contradiction. So when we look at Ephesians 6 and the full armour of God, what are we wearing, what aren't we wearing? Who should we be ministering to? Is it the zoo here, the zoo at home, or the zoo elsewhere? Or are we really prepared with the gospel like Paul was and he went out with the full armour of God? So the Zephaniah 2, verses 1 to 3, you know, what's it about? It's about the nation to return to Yahweh and worship him. The nation should not act, should not wait to act. They need to act now. We need to act now. We need to heed the warning. We need to turn back to God. But even for Zephaniah, the people Zephaniah was preaching to, even if you turn back to God, the decree's already gone forth. If they had turned to God nationalistically before the decree had gone forth, they may not have been judged or gone into judgment. But as we know from chapter 1, verse 2, the decree's already gone forth. Judgment is coming. Full stop. End of story. So for those who are prepared to humble themselves, you know, this is God's sovereignty. You know, perhaps, just perhaps, they'll be hidden, protected, treasured, even in judgment. But to show them that they are the people of God, they've got to seek God in humility, obedience and righteousness. For God to relent, the nation needs to repent before judgment arrives. For individuals who have repented, perhaps they will be hidden when judgment comes, but they will be hidden at the final judgment. When we think about the gospel, that's what it's about. It's about repenting before time is up. We don't know how long we've got on this earth. You, know, you see uh, TV shows, um, Saving Babies, Little Miracles and all these sort of shows about premature babies. You've got society you know, watching these shows and crying tears over them, la la la. You know, oh, it's sad. You know, oh, they're doing such a great, great job saving these children. And the doctors are. Meanwhile, in Queensland, last week, the MP Chris Pine says he wants to change the abortion laws so that uh, there's no time limit on, on abortion. So we want to cry tears over premature babies, but we want to kill premature, uh, premature babies that might be older but still in the womb. What a contradiction. Our society is no different to Israel or Judah back when Zephaniah was preaching. But still, God's holding on. He's waiting. You know? The call to repent is out there. <coughs> Let's turn to Matthew chapter 25. Just to use some biblical examples of um, not waiting till it's too late. Matthew 25, verses 1 to 14. <clears throat> the kingdom of, God, kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, 
they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will be not enough for us to buy, not enough for us and you. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him to the wedding feast, and the doors were shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I don't know you. Be on the alert, for you do not know the day nor the hour. You know, it's a good example. You, know. you need to be prepared. You need to be ready. We need to be repentant before it's too late. No point coming to God after the judgment. Same too, we could say that um, regarding the rapture. No point saying, God, take me, take me, take me, after the rapture's already taken place and you go, oh dear, I'm left behind. You know, no doubt some people will. You think of Esau in Genesis 27, verses 30 to 41. Uh, you know, Jacob pretended to be Esau, got the father's blessing, and then Esau comes along and says, all right, I've got the food you asked me to prepare, bless me now. He says, I've already blessed your brother. Sorry, there's none for you. And with tears, he said, bless me, please. Too late. He missed the opportunity, even though he was deceived out of it. When you think in... Um, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 to 23. David repenting and seeking forgiveness and also for the life of his and Bathsheba's child that was um, the result of adultery. The decree had gone out. The child will die. But David persisted. He sackcloth and ashes, wouldn't eat, try and repent and repent and repent. But the decree had already gone out. The consequences of your adultery, you know, the child would die. He tried to hide it. Tried to get away with it. Had, had um, Bathsheba's husband murdered. The decree went out, it was too late. Now, it's not always too late with God, but in some things it is. We've got to remember that God is sovereign. But it's when God sets time limits, those time limits are usually final. For us, we need to be hidden in Christ. When you think of Israel, Israel was God's wife in the typology of the uh, Old Testament. In the New Testament, we're the bride of Christ. To be hidden in God, we have to be hidden in Christ. We have to accept the gospel. We have the word. We need to study God's word. We need to be ready to give a defense for the faith that is within us. It is part and parcel of that armour that we were speaking about earlier on. The gospel, we need to be able to tell people the gospel clearly and succinctly. Or what? How will you feel on that day when you see those we recognise, friends and family, being judged and rejected by God? And what if we don't tell them or we had never told them? How will we feel on that day? There has to be repentance. We mustn't be arrogant and think once saved, always saved. After all, who is saved? Who's the winner of the race? Someone who starts it or someone who finishes it?
there has to be faith and works. We need faith, but faith that trusts God should be visible and be reflected by our actions. The only place to be hidden from God's wrath is being hidden in Christ. You know, when you look at Zephaniah, he says to seek, to seek, to seek. You know, we need to seek Yahweh. We need to seek God. But when will we find Yahweh? When will we find God? When do you find God? We find God when we find Christ. That's why it's hidden in Christ. And when we think of Jesus' name, Jesus' name in the Hebrew is um, Yeshua, Yehoshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. We are hidden when we are hidden in Yahweh's salvation, when we are hidden in the Anointed One. So I hope this message, when we consider what's required, what's required of others when we, you know, you've heard the saying, keep short accounts with God. You know, it's something we should all do. We need to be penitent. We need to be humble. We need to bow ourselves before God. It's not bow ourselves while holding on to something back here. Let go of the things that are holding us back so we can face God, seek God. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures that are there to help us, to guide us, so that we know the, the failures of the past, the failures of your people in the past and that we might not go their way, Lord, but we might seek after you. As you've called them, you, seek, you call us. You call us to seek you in humility and righteousness. We ask you, Lord, for your continued grace and mercy for all of us, and that you might give us the words to say and the strength to speak to others about your gospel, Lord. We thank you for everything, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we go, we might just... Have a look at Psalm 27. Psalm 27, starting verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defence of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers come, again, come upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumble and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though, the, though war arises against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek that I may dwell in, in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent he will hide me. He will lift me up on the rock and now my head will be lifted, upon my, lifted above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me in the level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desires of my adversaries, for false witnesses have, have arisen against me, and such as breathe, breathe out violence. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord 
in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord.